How prepared is the human race for an extinction level event? Well, we'd like to think that we could overcome most things that would threaten our survival of our species, but really, the reality of the situation is we can barely handle the naturally occurring diseases on our planet when an outbreak does happen. Everything is all panic, really. We break down to our most basic instincts. However, that said, there is still cooperation, at least concerning small groups of people, when faced with a scenario like this due to human socialization. In the movie Splinter, both these ideas would come together on a group of four, showing just how underprepared a human actually is for something that we don't understand. Deep within the backwoods of Oklahoma, a creature likely originating from outside of Earth's biosphere touched down and immediately began infecting animals within the woods. The creature, however, didn't think, it didn't really plot, it was just better adapted at taking over our meat suits and influencing Earth's squishy fauna than those bodies were at controlling the infection. So in today's episode, we will discuss what this creature is, what exactly it does to the body of an animal it infects, as well as its main mode of transference. So as per usual, which per usual I say every time, there'll be a timestamp up on screen. Jump to that point if you want to skip the summary of the movie, if you've actually seen it already, or you just don't want it spoiled. The movie was actually pretty good for like a low budget flick, so in case you haven't seen it and would want to go do that, I would actually recommend it. You know, though I'm no film critic, I'm just a dude with a YouTube channel. Anyhow, head there and we'll meet back up. Otherwise, let's drop into this. The movie opens on a gas station where our boy here is about to get a bad case of splinters. As he sits, he hears a noise from behind and heads out to find out what it was. Seeing an animal, he attempts to shoot it away, but then is attacked instead. Assuming it to be rabid, it begins to tear into him, infecting him quickly with this mystery disease. We see his body begin to contort and twist, and then we immediately cut to a couple camping. On their anniversary, they agree to head out in the woods and do some camping together. The wood appears much more adept at dealing with the environment, and the guy is just a biology nerd. I mean, honestly, who chooses a biology degree anyways? After showing how good he is at breaking tents, they decide that they will have to stay at a hotel as they can't sleep outside. They load back up and head towards the road. While driving, a woman exits the woods and then flags them down for help. They pass her, but then decide that they should probably figure out what she needs. While discussing in the car what to do, a man approaches the car and then asks them to roll down the window. They don't immediately do it, so he brandishes a handheld to which they oblige to follow the lead on this one. Alright, so like, here's my favorite part. It's the uh, old adage of smart people have no common sense, but dumb people survive purely off of common sense. Sometimes. Seth is given orders multiple times to do things that he just doesn't know how to do. Being told to drive, he can't drive stick. Told not to make a move, he tries to grab an axe. I mean, I get it, don't get me wrong, but I'm relating, like, ridiculously hardcore to Seth. It's kind of disturbing. And I will continue to relate as the movie goes along. With Seth unable to drive stick, it's up to Polly to drive her car. While cruising down the road with the convict known as Dennis and his drug addict girlfriend Lacey, it's pretty clear that Lacey is starting to suffer some heavy withdrawal from whatever that she's been taking and has been hooked on. While moving along, they end up running over an animal. This blows out their tire in the process. Dennis orders Seth to change the tire, but again, he doesn't know how to, to which Dennis remarks that he suffers from a severe case of CDS. Can't do crap. Vindication, as I do in fact know how to change a tire. I've done it many times in my life. Anyhow, Lacey believes it to be Ginger, which I guess appears to have been her puppy, and her and Seth walk over and look at it. Running over this animal has caused them to get a flat tire, so Polly and Dennis change the tire, where Dennis is then stuck in the finger by what appears to be a black splinter. Thinking nothing of it, they continue to work on changing that tire. While checking the animal out, Lacey freaks out telling Seth to save it because he's a doctor, to which he expertly surmises, yeah, that thing's not living. As soon as he does, however, the body begins to rise somewhat. A little shocked at this, they stand there as the creature lunges at them, but its body is so severely broken by the hit, it misses. Lacey takes off in her withdrawal scrambled brains, screaming. Dennis freaks out thinking Seth tried something, and then they all get back in the car and take off, leaving the tire with the splinters and the creature still behind. The animal didn't just blow out the tire though, it also sliced straight through the radiator. With coolant completely depleted in the engine, it begins to overheat, forcing them to stop at a gas station only a few miles down the road. Dennis asks Seth if he actually knows how to pump gas or not, while he and Polly head inside. Lacey takes off to use the bathroom for other purposes than probably actually just using the bathroom, while Seth pumps gas. As Lacey tries to enter the bathroom, the door appears to be wedged shut. Inside, Polly and Dennis cannot find the person running the gas station, so Dennis decides to start stealing food. Eventually, Lacey gets the door open and reveals the attendant who had been infected earlier. He pleads for her to basically end him before getting up and attacking her. She runs away with the attendant on her heels. Dennis comes out and fires a shot at the attendant, but it does nothing, and the attendant ends up attacking Lacey, who then falls to the ground after hitting her head, and she pretty much met her in there, and then turns to attack Seth. It misses Seth and then hits the car. Dennis, Polly, and Seth all run inside and then lock the door. Dennis has a freak out seeing Lacey laying on the ground outside, to which they 
come up with a plan. Dennis and Polly will watch the monitors to see if the creature on the car moves or not and warn Dennis if it does while he checks on Lacey. Dennis makes his way outside and then begins to see Lacey's arm move. Assuming she's still alive, he tells her to stay still while he drags her inside. In the process of dragging her, he is attacked and has to move back inside, barely being let in by the couple. As he enters, he turns to see Lacey is back up and attacking the glass. They shut the door on her arm in the process, which causes her hand to be severed. The hand gets up thing style and begins, I guess you call it, looking around. Dennis drops a bag of charcoal on it and completely breaks it after determining the pieces have the capability to attack on their own. After picking up the bag, Seth then inspects it and notices something new. Nothing like this exists on Earth. The hand was being metabolized actively to which a black goo was the metabolic waste. Or at least that's what they think it is. Because usually uh, preliminary ideas can be wrong. While determining what the crap is happening, a sheriff arrives and attempts to arrest Dennis. The trio yell at her to get back in her car and call it in as something is out there. Believing the couple to actually just be suffering from a severe form of Stockholm Syndrome, she assures them that they are okay and Dennis will be arrested and he won't try to do anything now. After attempting to call it in but being too far out in the woods to get a signal, she ends up seeing something jump across the roof. Too quick to spot, it eventually jumps down on her and uses its spikes to cut into her midsection. Upon doing so, the weight of her legs and the severing of her spine as well as most of the tissue causes her to bisect and then be pulled up to the roof. While up there, the creature joins her flesh to its via the spikes to become an even larger beast. The trio then devises a plan to get help. Now it's time for the big brainy brain guy to have an idea. So Polly and Dennis decide that a forest fire is the best way to get help even though they are literally sitting on thousands of gallons of fuel. Seth convinces them that that's not the way to go as they continue to dump lighter fluid out the door and instead he tries to get the sheriff's radio that has been left on the ground and attached to her lower half. Upon doing so, the creature attacks once more and then shoves its arm through a small opening in the window to which it becomes dismembered. The arm then begins hunting all of them inside the store, attempting to infect everyone. Dennis opens the door to the fridge and they hide from the arm as it moves away and breaks off its attack. While in the fridge, Dennis's arm begins to hurt. Earlier, he had one finger break as a result, but now the whole arm is beginning to turn bad. In an evil dead farewell to arms moment, they decide to amputate the turning limb and save him from completely changing. Okay, so this part made me cringe like horribly bad. So they start to cut into the bicep and then cut around the bone. Ah! Have you ever been pinched on your inner arm before? It really hurts. Then the bone, just the bone break with, oh god. Anyways, good lord, I can feel it. After taking off the arm, they presumably dispose of it so that it can't get up and then attack if they weren't careful. After Seth continues to inspect the creatures in terms that due to the infection pattern and how it spreads, that it must actually be a fungus or mold taking control of corpses as well as the living. As it does, it consumes the blood of the person. Because it attacks animals, he figures out that it must be hunting by some form of temperature sensing, which is why at the beginning of all this, the creature attacked the overheating car rather than Seth as it was the hottest thing around. They still need to call for help, so a plan is hatched. Considering it's 93 degrees outside, Seth says to lower his body temperature to ambient levels so he can actually walk outside and call for help in the squad car, which is actually a pretty ingenious plan as long as you don't pass out. They lower his body temperature successfully and he begins to walk outside in relative safety. However, as he walks, his core temperature begins to slowly rise. As he is walking, Paul and Dennis attempt to distract the creature with fireworks. It works momentarily, but eventually it breaks off. With Seth's body's temperature rising, he is stuck in the car while the thing is outside trying to get in. Eventually, it leaves as it is able to enter the store. Dennis and Polly hide once more in the freezer to avoid detection. When the creature left the car, Seth was able to grab the boomstick and then head into the building. He ends up helping Dennis and Polly escape as the lighter fluid trail was set ablaze by fireworks. Dennis decides that he's done running at this point. He offers to keep the creature contained while Polly and Seth make a run for it due to him being heavily infected around the neck in the process, meaning you're not really going to cut that out. As the creature exits the building, Dennis then shoots a gas pump, igniting it and the creature and ending it for good. However, Dennis is still infected. Dennis gives Polly and Seth a key to a bank account and tells it to give it to the wife of the man that he shot that he ended up in jail for. Dennis then blows the propane tanks, incinerating himself, the station, and any of the bodies that were left infected around the building. As we see in the end, however, it's not over. Many native fauna in the area were infected and were still laying dormant in the woods, waiting for other animals to happen by to spread the infection further. So getting a good look at this creature, the first thing is it's fairly easy to surmise that it's not from this planet. In the immortalized words of Seth, this is something new. And seeing as it's new, what can we draw from its infection ability as well as what it does to the body? Well, first thing I would like to cover is what may be its intended prey. What do we know about molds? Well, they're usually found in dark, damp areas. They tend to flourish away from sunlight, preferably. Seeing as this material was found in the woods, this would at least be somewhat palatable for the mold growth. But I would imagine it's completely 
completely possible it prefers to exist underground or within caves. But what may be found in those caves or underground? That's right, potentially armored animals. Looking throughout Earth's history, there have been many examples of armored creatures and still are. But considering what the splinter is able to do to a pressurized tire or more importantly to a radiator, which is metal, nothing on Earth would have enough armor to resist this thing. Likely, the animal that would be infected by this creature would have to be something that dwells under the ground and is armored with much more thick plating, perhaps likely consuming either metallic substances or rocky material. To give you the best idea, this would likely be sort of like the rock worms from Gears of War 2. Why do I believe this to be the case? Well, really life is nothing but adaptations and reactions when you get down to it. Because of this, it's not hard to imagine seeing that this mold would likely have to overcome some pretty blunt and stout armor in order to infect whatever creature it intends to digest. But that said, infecting isn't enough if the creature falls too quickly, which may suggest the low dosage rate being a slower infection, a much slower infection actually, and even with the infection completely taking over the body, it is still able to move creatures. So with this just quick likely summary of the mold, it would clearly hail from another planet, the fauna there may be much more heavily armored than anything located on Earth, and when the armor is pierced by the mold, the infection proceeds as normal, although there may be actually some adaptations, making this creature not completely infected, but who can really know that. Then something happened, likely a meteor or asteroid impact that shot out a chunk of rock from the surface containing this mold into space where we find it in the Oklahoma forest after impact. After landing in Oklahoma, we see though the absolute power of invasive species. Sometimes with invasive species in their native environment, they are pretty low on the totem pole. Things around them have adapted to their presence and then they to them. When entering a new area, however, these adaptations make them more greatly adept at annihilating the local populace of creatures. Take fire ants, for instance. They are an invasive species and have a propensity towards wiping out giant populations of insects in the U.S. as a result. They even pretty much war with the black ants that have been here forever on a daily basis, to which the black ants have actually had to adapt to deal with them. Or even the lionfish in the Caribbean, compared to the local fish, they out-eat and out-hunt them, leading to a possible extinction-level event for some species in the water. Or even something that's closer to home for me, uh, pythons in the Everglades. They have been known to not just destroy bird populations, but also eat other alligators down there, and it's really becoming an issue. But the last example is a pretty important one. Alligators are pretty strong, as we all know, in the Everglades, and they used to be top dog. But now another apex predator around is causing issues to the balance of this ecosystem. This is essentially the mold and the humans, because even though we are more mobile than the mold, the mold has a way to make itself mobile that humans cannot overcome except through fire. So let's take a look at what happens to the body as the mold begins to take hold. It's pretty clear that the mold's control over the meat suit is absolutely an evolutionary trait. Again, as mentioned earlier in the hypothetical scenario where it comes from, when a creature becomes infected, it may either A, take a while to spread because the creature is adapted. I mean, it can even be imagined that they could lose a section of their body, sort of like how lizards lose tails. Or B, it progresses the same way as on our planet. Either way, with this section of the body or whole body, it would likely be prudent to spread outwards, sort of like how seeds spread away from the parent plant. So the mold controls the functioning of the body to move itself out of the area towards new hunting areas, or it progresses slow enough that the host moves to new areas, which is exactly what we see with the gas station attendant and with Dennis. When the gas station attendant is infected, we are not shown the dosage, we aren't really shown anything about the attack, all we know is that the other animal was infected and judging by the aggressive nature shown by the attendant later, we can only assume that the animal gave him a large dosage of the mold. Regardless of the dosage, the ending is an absolute assurance. When Lacey goes to open the door, he is laying on the ground with many spikes exiting his face, arms, body, basically everywhere. What I find interesting, however, is that he's still alive. Despite this heavy infection, he tells her to end him. Except I can't say what he actually says because then I'll get spotted by the overlords, but this implies that his brain is still functional. He then gets up and proceeds to attack. We see later with Dennis, as his infection progresses, it starts with pain in his ligaments and fingers specifically. The infection is small as he was just pricked in the finger a few hours ago, but as Seth discovers later, the creature is actually eating his blood and the mold continues to grow within his hand as a result. After breaking several of his fingers eventually, it begins to take hold of the muscle within the forearm itself, and it is determined that the arm has to be cut off to stop it from progressing as far as the gas station attendant did. And this is only after it starts snapping bones in his arm. So clearly this thing would have a localized influence over the neural tissue at the beginning, but I believe it progresses past that point eventually. But you know what this almost reminds me of? If you really look at this stuff? A ferro fluid. We see when the hand is broken by the charcoal bag that it leaks this fluid that appears almost like waves, like it's being influenced by something unseen. But we also see that the splinters are very 
very much so solid. And this would lead me to believe that this mold may actually have extreme magnetic properties and as a result, how it influences your nerves is by the same magnetism. So the generalized thought is that a magnetic field really doesn't affect humans too much. After all, we live in one and we can go get a powerful magnet right now and put it up to your arm and nothing happens, right? Well, this is true. But if the magnetic field does get strong enough, it can actually begin to affect the ion balance within nerves themselves. When this does happen, this can cause the nerves to fire more aggressively or not at all and everything in between. Magnetism absolutely can affect the nerves if it's at a high enough level, which this may explain why this creature goes after the blood of animals on Earth. It seems likely to me that animals or material it originally grew on likely had an element that could be magnetized quite easily as found in ferro fluid and as a result it chose to attach and grow on this stuff and this would be used for nutrients and the magnetism could just be an off product and of course it's iron iron is one of those elements that is massively important and luckily for earth or really us i guess it's also relatively abundant but also abundant in animals our blood contains iron and seeing as this mold is drawn to that iron it would make sense for it to feast on that specifically within an animal with a mold going after the blood rather than just the tissue of a person it would also make complete sense as to why the gas station attendant was still alive after his grievous infection. It's not really consuming him, it's just consuming his blood, but as it spreads, the magnetic properties would cause him to lose control of his body as he literally loses control of his neurons. Again, the same thing with Dennis's arm snapping like a chicken wing. With parts of the body already deceased, however, we see that with Lacey, her arm quickly begins to be taken over and twitch. And even when severed, the hand is able to get up and move. So surely the neurons would probably be destroyed when they're deprived of blood, and I do believe this happens eventually, especially considering at the end of the movie, we see basically stationary animals, they're no longer moving. But have you ever seen that video where somebody puts uh, basically salt on the muscle of a fish and it begins to move again? Even though it's been hours since they've become just a piece of meat, with the ionic level changes, the body can still move, which is likely what the mold is doing to the hand meat and body meat of others. My last point towards magnetism being the culprit and the ferrofluid thinking is what happens to the sheriff after she is bisected. It's easy to think, oh, Oh, well, alien mold combined to make big alien mold, but I don't think so. The way the splinters actually reach out to one another after part of her body is already infected, it looks completely like a magnetic embrace rather than just some thinking creature to me. This may also be how it moves. Using these splinters, it can move a limb and even has enough power to snap bone if it turns a certain way. So now let's discuss hunting. As we know, the mold is alive and not just an amalgamation of magnetism and ferrofluid. As a result, it naturally has a desire to grow, thrive, and survive. It is said that in the movie, it hunts by body heat, or at least senses body heat. This would mean that animals of the planet that it's native to are organisms that contain heat. And I'm about to have a Vsauce moment, but does it really mean that? Considering this stuff would likely be underground, and how the material is not able to determine the difference between body heat and, say, the heat of an overheated car, what is it really sensing? So it consumes, presumably iron, it's looking for heat, and it's underground. What does that say to you? Well, it should be telling you that likely this creature is looking for iron reserves underneath the ground or animals that consume those iron reserves and produce heat. The clues are all there as to what its food source is, you just have to separate them out. So what do I think is going on? The animals of Earth are just sort of an unfortunate media to be used. The mold likely desires to consume iron, which is why it goes for blood. It looks for heat because the deeper underground you get, that's where iron is found and it's also way warmer and there may be differences in heat in certain areas indicating what is edible and what is not. When it hit Earth, animals nearby mimic the heat it looks for and upon attaching itself, it did find iron, which it consumes to continue the infection. Too much heat does destroy it though, which means it's looking for a specific range, and through this interaction with the bodies of animals, it is able to influence the nervous tissue gradient and move limbs, but even after they are severed.